Tonight on Primetime Politics, history in the making. Today, a new era begins. And today, we get to work. Wab Canoe is sworn in as the first First Nations Premier in Manitoba and unveils his cabinet with a promise to fix health care and bring people together. Coming up, we will speak with the Manitoba Premier. And... I come to Israel with a single message. You're not alone. You are not alone. U.S. President Joe Biden says the U.S. stands with Israel but also offers hope that humanitarian aid may soon get into Gaza. Coming up, we will speak with the chief representative for the Palestinian general delegation in Canada. This is Primetime Politics. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Serapio. History was made in Manitoba today with the swearing-in of Wab Canoe as the province's 25th premier. It is a new day in our province. Today, a new era begins. And today, we get to work for you, the people of Manitoba. We're committed to putting you, the people of Manitoba, first. And we will devote every single day of the next four years to serving you and the future generations who will someday walk these lands. And I am so proud of the message that it sends to young people in Manitoba that the people of this province have come together to declare that we are one people, one Manitoba, who are going to build one future together. Canoe is now Manitoba's first ever First Nations Premier, and the history making does not end there. His cabinet also includes Manitoba's first black and non binary minister and the first First Nations women to be appointed to Manitoba's cabinet. We are now joined by the newly sworn in Premier of Manitoba, Wab Canoe. Premier, thank you for taking the time. Thanks for having me. You know, at the Fort Garry Hotel uh, on election night, you were obviously elated, but today at the swearing-in ceremony, there were uh, many times when the camera would turn to you and you were either fighting back tears or wiping away tears. What were you feeling today? Well, it's just uh, an extraordinarily uh, strong feeling of humility. You know, we had luminaries from our province, like uh, Anita Neville and Murray Sinclair presiding. We had former cabinet minister and Kevin Chief, who was doing, you know, Métis jigging and bringing up the uh, up-tempo energy. It was just such an uplifting ceremony that uh, as somebody who has been honoured with this extraordinary opportunity to serve the people of Manitoba, I just felt so humble that um, we were able to, to, to witness what we did today, which was people from different walks of life coming together. Coming together. And, just, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, as you say, coming together, and you've chosen Uzoma Asaguara as the first non-binary minister in Manitoba history, if not Canada's. You've chosen them as your minister of health and health care being a big issue during the provincial campaign. What kind of mandate have you given the minister? What do you hope is actually achieved by your government, for example, in the next 100 days? Well, it's a huge task. You know, fixing health care, as everyone in Canada can appreciate, is a very tall order. And here in Manitoba, it's perhaps even more challenging given some of the, the bad outcomes that we've had over the past few years. And so what I've asked Minister uh, Asaguera to do is to start with the staff, start with the people in the healthcare system. And as we staff up along the way, let's get a handle on emergency room waits. Let's lay the foundation so we can build new emergency rooms, such as at the uh, Victoria Hospital, which is in, in Southside Winnipeg, suburban Winnipeg, and uh, to fulfill our election commitments to the people of Manitoba. But along the way, everything that we do in healthcare has to start with the staff. And Uzoma Asaguera, in addition to making history in numerous respects, uh, is also somebody who comes from the front lines of healthcare. They were a registered psychiatric nurse. They are somebody who's worked in long-term care facilities. They are somebody who is still very closely connected 
to the healthcare workforce, and I think that that will serve them well and our province well as we look to repair our healthcare system. You know, you also appointed Bernadette Smith a member of your cabinet. In particular, she now heads this new Ministry of Housing, Addictions and Homelessness. She's also the minister responsible for mental health. Can you talk to us about the grouping of those priorities and why you've decided to put it all under one ministry? Yeah, uh, Winnipeg, along with many other communities in our province, like Thompson and Brandon and others, has seen so much more visible signs of the impacts of homelessness and some of the related social challenges. We see them in bus shelters. We see these challenges underneath bridges and in communities right across the province. And we have committed, after listening to the experts and listening to leaders in community and in the world of business and in society, that we need to take a cross-departmental approach. We need to take an approach that breaks down barriers, cuts through the excuses, and just delivers the wraparound services that people need to be successful in uh, getting off of the streets and into housing. And so the appointment of Minister Smith today is uh, representative of a symbolic change in our government where we're going to bring everything under one roof from the housing programs to the addictions programs to the other wraparound supports that people will need. And so as we as a government cut through the silos and foster greater collaboration, we're sending a message to the other levels of government that we want to work with them in a very positive and constructive way across Manitoba and to the community organizations and business leaders that we all want to work together. And so my hope is that by bringing everything under one roof and in one uh, united uh, approach, that we'll be able to, to replicate the same thing when we work with the other levels of government and with community as well. Okay, let me pick up on the theme of breaking down silos, because not only are you the Premier, you're also now Minister for Indigenous Reconciliation, the Minister responsible for Intergovernmental Affairs and uh, International Relations. Why did you decide to assume those titles, in particular Minister of Reconciliation? Well, I think most people across Canada would know that uh, premiers uh, appoint themselves as a minister for intergovernmental affairs, and it means that you're taking the lead in engaging with the federal government and with the municipal governments, as well as, you know, other uh, state and, uh, you know, uh, foreign governments as well. And so the message that I want to send with this appointment to First Nations and to Métis government leaders is that our government is going to respect you as the leaders of government. We are going to take you seriously and set a tone at the highest levels that we are going to have a respectful relationship and a positive relationship so that we can make things better for everybody in Manitoba. So does that mean that you'll take personal responsibility uh, for overseeing a search of the Prairie Green Landfill? I believe that I will have a, a leadership role in that conversation, but of course I will be working with the other members of cabinet sworn in today who have a, a particular interest in this file. And what I would say that our next step on this is, now that we've been sworn in, is we are going to reach out to the families and have a conversation with them so that we can find a respectful path forward. You know, uh, when I was leaving Manitoba after the provincial uh, election, I was reading an article from Tanya Talaga in the Globe and Mail, and she said your election was essentially the, the, the coming of the eighth, the lighting of the eighth fire. What do you make of that? Well, I think there's high expectations for our government. We could say that across many different communities. Certainly, Indigenous peoples, I think, have high expectations for our administration. People in rural Manitoba have high expectations. They've sent uh, people from communities like Brandon, like Dauphin, from some other rural municipalities to sit with us. People from all walks of life are optimistic that uh, we're going to deliver for them. And so I feel a great responsibility to do just that, to do a good job. We ran a campaign about bringing people in Manitoba together rather than dividing people. I'm very proud that our province embraced that message. And now it's incumbent on us as a newly sworn in uh, government officials to deliver on that, starting with health care and starting with affordability. Premier Canoe, uh, thank you again for the time. Congratulations today. Thank you so much, Michael. To Israel now, where the U.S. President Joe Biden made a visit this morning to speak about the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, but also to stand with Israel and to show the world American solidarity. We moved U.S. military assets to the region, including positioning the USS Ford Carrier Strike Group in the eastern Mediterranean, with the USS Eisenhower on the way to deter, to defer further aggression against Israel and to prevent this conflict from spreading. 
The world will know that Israel is, Israel is stronger than ever. And my message to any state or any other hostile actor, thinking about attacking Israel remains the same as it was a week ago. Don't. 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 Biden's visit comes a day after a Gaza hospital was hit by a blast. Hundreds were killed in a facility filled with the sick and injured and civilians who were hoping the hospital would be a place of refuge and safety. Gazan authorities blame Israel, but Israel and the United States say their intelligence point to a rocket from Palestinian militants meant for Israel but gone astray. We're now joined by Mona Abu Amara, the chief representative of the Palestinian general delegation here in Canada. Uh, Madame Abu Amara, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate this is a difficult time. And uh, as we were talking before we came on air, you've been receiving many phone calls. Could you talk to us about the pleas that you're hearing, the stories that you're hearing right now? Um, I think the desperation in those pleas are... Um, can be vivid when people are not asking you for anything but just telling you that uh, they might not be there the next day and that's what's heart heartbreaking and and uh, makes you feel that they do not have hope in you or in any, anybody else to save them because they feel that um, death or desperation is imminent so it's um, it's heartbreaking yeah. Today we, we saw Joe Biden in Israel and we also heard the statement from the Israeli government that they will uh, allow the, the, uh, the delivery of humanitarian aid uh, going into Gaza through Egypt. What's your reaction to that news? You know, the low is so bo the, the bar is so low. Um, at this point, it's uh, day 12 with uh, 3,000, uh, more than like almost 4,000 people uh, killed and 13,000 uh, injured. Um, basic necessities for people, just for the injured and, and uh, children uh, who live there are non-existent. So the the main cause, and Israel has been saying that since day one, that it will let um, the aid to allow it to come in. But what we saw was totally the opposite. We saw threats of bombing the convoys. We saw actual bombing of the Rafah uh, uh, border. We saw bombing of the warehouses for the UNRWA, where they keep what's left of uh, of aid. And since then, Rafah board crossing on the Palestinian side has been bombed numerous times. So um, we hear a lot of talk, but at the end of the day, um, the reality is a lot, a lot different. Do you have any added assurance, though, in any sense, now that Joe Biden has come there? Because he, he, he stated, or at least the, the state, U.S. State Department has stated, that part of their, their intent was, yes, to show support for Israel, but also to, to, to find out the parameters of what Israel is trying to do. Joe Biden being very clear, he believes the, the enemy here is not the Palestinian people, but Hamas. Uh, I understand, again, what's being said. Uh, but uh, we have uh, thousands of people murdered, uh, six, more than 60 percent of them women and children. So um, I don't know why wait to day 12 to tell Israel that their uh, enemy is not the Palestinian people when the Palestinian people are being butchered every day. We have uh, around 50 families that have been wiped off the civil record. 500 people just do not exist anymore, whole families. So um, it's hard to um, see the, the beautiful side of uh, that change and attention to the human uh, crises that have been created solely because of uh, impunity and uh, utter support with uh, unconditional, unequivocal, as um, the free world says it uh, in, in uh, their statement. And that no, knowing perfectly what it means when it comes to Gaza. You have uh, 365 uh, square kilometers with 2.3 million people, um, more than half uh, of them children. So no matter what type of uh, response that is, uh, unequivocal, a uh, green light to genocide, which we are witnessing now. Um. I appreciate it. It's not an easy question to, to ask of you, but I, I, I must ask it because it has been said that what is happening right now 
is because of Hamas's attack on October the 7th. And so it is Hamas that has put the Palestinian people in danger. What do you say to that? Listen, if Israel can excuse itself for uh, bombing civilians, then it can't carry that rhetoric uh, when it talks about its civilian. You can't have the cake and eat it, too. Uh, if uh, civilians are um, off the bat, then you actually do something uh, to prevent them from being the target. And until now, we haven't seen that ever uh, happening. We, we have seen schools, we have seen hospitals like uh, yesterday, and it doesn't matter that we always have a vague um, situation when it comes to the world, the need for the world to take um, a stand against something that Israel has done. Uh, but um, from our experience, looking at everything that has happened, the experts, it's very easy to see that uh, neither Hamas nor Jihad have the capability to um, inflict uh, fatalities in this uh, in this type of um, uh, just force of hundreds of uh, casualties and um, simply at this point at this point in time there is a need for Israel to continue whatever it's doing and that would jeopardize its ability because uh, it would be very hard for the states that the steadfast allies to support something like that if the case was proved to be uh, Israel. And that reminds us uh, of uh, the Shirin Abu Aqle moment when uh, Israel decided to claim that uh, it was a Palestinian uh, fighter that killed her. Uh, and then uh, it changed to, it might be us, but we don't know. Then it is us, but we didn't mean to. Although with the Al Arab hospital, mm -hmm. um, Israel points to their their uh, tracking saying that it was uh, an errant rocket fired by Palestinian militants and, yes. and and Joe Biden came today and backed up that story and US military officials say that they have several vectors of intelligence that point not to Israel but to a rocket from from uh, again uh, extremist elements within the Gaza Strip. Yeah, I, I think, uh, needless to say, the other day, uh, Mr. Biden cried on TV saying he saw um, videos or pictures, and then the White House came out and said that was not the case. So uh, I'm sorry uh, if uh, Palestinians need an investigation that does not involve the stakeholders of the, in this war uh, to decide what the reality um, is on the ground. because. Once we move away in months of times, and then it's, it's not going to matter anymore who uh, did it, and uh, uh, Israel, as usual, will have impunity, total and utter impunity, like in many other um, cases. And the case of uh, this hospital is not any different than any other place that uh, Israel, for instance, uh, bombed the, the UNRWA uh, shelter for people who were uh, running uh, to when they asked them to uh, leave their homes, uh, the convoys that were trying to flee after Israel ordered them to uh, turn uh, um, to another place just simply because it wants uh, to evacuate, to miss this place, 1.1 million people in 24 hours. So. Uh, these attacks are not separate. The, the Al uh, Ahli Baptist Hospital was not just bombed yesterday, it was bombed the day before with two warning bombs, as they were told. Not, not to mention that they were asked to evacuate the hospital, which was not something they could do. There are just a couple what, left. What do you take of the, the charge and the allegation then that uh, in, in, so, in many ways, it is hard because it is Hamas that are using the Palestinian people as human shields, hospitals and schools included. Well, you you see it on uh, on TV. You see who's being killed. So it's it's not something that's happening behind. But should uh, Hamas bear doors. the responsibility for that? Because that's that's what American officials often point to, what Israeli officials often point to, that it is Hamas that's using the Palestinian people as shields. They don't want to hurt the Palestinian people, as they say. Their target is Hamas. But they're bombing the civilians in but those does Hamas places. But does Hamas need to take responsibility for that? 
Did, did you get Hamas after the bombings happened? Did uh, uh, Israel or the U.S. come out and say yes, we got militants from Hamas in a hospital or in the school or um, in a bakery, like a bakery that brings uh, bread to 100,000 people? When that happens, then we can talk. But just saying that we know something, and then when we see people carrying the, the remains, uh, parts of their children, in trash bags, carrying them around, there's no excuse for that in the world, to have these thousands of people being butchered in that manner, for the simple excuse that Israel is putting, uh, as if it's targeting Hamas, while it's targeting the whole of the Palestinian population. I'm wondering what you want to hear from Canada right now, what you would like to see from the Canadian government. Because the Canadian government, uh, while expressing that Israel has the right to defend itself from, from terrorism, from Hamas, they too are expressing their concern for the Palestinian people. So what would you like to see from Canada? Um, I think the, the thing with the, um, the right of uh, self-defense for Israel has been uh, a key issue in the numbers of people being uh, murdered by Israel. Because as I told you, the um, unequivocal support and that right is, is not restrained. If after everything that has happened, we haven't seen uh, the government's not just asking, you know, when it comes to Palestine, the, the Western world always stands uh, uh, still um, about action. We, we hear condemnations, we hear calls, but um, it would be much easier than to send these uh, planes, warplanes and ammunition and uh, to, to the region to force, to push for um, a solution that the international legitimacy has already uh, agreed on a two-state solution where the Palestinians uh, have a just solution to their misery, the 75 years of misery that uh, was put aside. So what I wish to see uh, Canada do is to end um, the discourse of having Palestine be the exception to the protection of the rules-based international order, uh, for Canada to uh, implement its policy towards uh, Palestine, to push not only with uh, uh, statements but with actual actions to push for uh, the two-state solution. Um, because no occupation will end by itself. Uh, no one would want to end an occupation by themselves. Uh, the international community that made uh, this rules-based international order needs to push for that, and we've seen it elsewhere, um, and, and, and how hard the international community works and what it actually could do to enforce that uh, rule. Thank you for the time today. Thank you so much for having me. Now, earlier today, I also spoke to Janice Stein. She is the founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. I asked her to share some thoughts on some of the bigger questions being asked today. Listen, I want to begin uh, with the blast at the Ali Arab Hospital. Uh, authorities, as you know, in Gaza blamed Israel very early on. But the U.S. president today backed up the Israeli report, which pointed to errant rockets fired not by Israel, but by Palestinian fighters. And that is apparently based on multiple strands of U.S. intelligence. How important was that backing from the U.S. president on this incident in particular? You know, uh, clearly when a major um, set of intelligence agencies confirm based on multiple streams of evidence, it matters. But where does it matter, Michael? It's not going to matter in what we call the Arab street. Um, it was almost instantaneous. And you can understand, given the peak of intensity right now, that that would be uh, where people would go. It will clearly matter in this country. It will matter. Um, in other countries that um, really look at the evidence. But you know better than anybody that a story gets told in the first few minutes. And then almost no matter what comes up, it is very hard to change the story. Uh, and, and I think it's worth saying one other thing here, Michael, about this. Mm -hmm. Who 
however this happened, whether it was an Islamic Jihad rocket that misfired, um, however this happened, I did not believe, even when I first heard the story yesterday, that this was a deliberate assault um, on the hospital. It made no sense for any party to this conflict to do this. So we are, we have to be careful when we attribute, when it just violates all common sense. And secondly, this is what happens. We call it the fog of war. Terrible, terrible, terrible. God awful accidents happen and innocent civilians pay with their lives. You know, a lot of people are wondering about uh, the possibility of a brokered peace. Is there anyone that can do that or will a ground invasion have to happen first for Israel? You know, I think that's what's really changed here um, as a result of the attack um, 10 days ago uh, in southern Israel. Even the United States, which would normally be counseling against in the strongest possible terms, um, did not, I don't think, fully put the brakes on a ground invasion uh, in the way they would have uh, in the past. There's a sense some the page has turned now as a result of those attacks. So what I think President Biden did, in addition to all the public conversations, the private conversations were very much what scale ground invasion. What's the goal? What's the end game here? What's the exit strategy um, of that ground invasion? He asked the question over and over, how does this end? And, you know, in public, where you are not getting a clear answer, either from U.S. officials or from officials in Israel. But he really went to induce caution, but he did not go to entirely stop that ground invasion. And frankly, there's no possibility now of any kind of negotiated solution to this. There's no possibility even of a ceasefire. And in large part, because of the scale of the dead um, and wounded uh, last two Saturdays ago, but also there are 200 hostages. Mm -hmm. um, and that really, it complicates both ends. It complicates the fighting, but it surely complicates any kind of negotiation process, as long as those hostages are being held and their fate uncertain. You heard, Michael, one of the things President Biden said this morning, mm -hmm. he wants Red Cross access to those hostages. Yeah. That is effectively treating them as prisoners of war. Janice Stein. Now, we did have a longer conversation, the two of us, and to find that, go to our website on cpac.ca or you can search CPAC Canada on YouTube. But that is our program for this Wednesday evening. I'm Michael Serapio. For everyone here at CPAC, thank you for joining us. Primetime Politics is back tomorrow, but up next, Estebejan avec l'Essentiel.